Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruvain speaking to you from south of Jerusalem in the Holy Land, the beautiful land, the promised land of Israel. Today is the 29th day of the month of Nisan, 5784. It's May 7th, 2024. This evening is the beginning of a two-day Rosh Chodesh celebration. Rosh Chodesh, of course, meaning the new month. And the new month is Iyar, the second month of the Hebrew calendar, when we begin with the month of Nisan, the month of the Exodus, the month of our liberation, the month that Hashem told uh, Israel while still in Egypt, this will be the first of your months. So you may be scratching your head and saying, wait a minute, I thought that Tishrei was the first month. I thought Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, right? Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the year, isn't it? That's Tishrei. Well, you are correct. So yes, Israel has two different uh, months what we mark as the beginning of the year as well as two other months that are New Year's for one for uh, trees as in fruit bearing trees and uh, for the purpose of bringing offerings and the other with, has to do with animals for bringing offerings but anyway uh, Tishrei is indeed the month of Rosh Hashanah and that's basically considered to be by majority opinion the the month that marks the beginning of the creation of the world, whereas whereas Nisan marks the beginning of the creation of the nation of Israel. So they're both supremely important uh, to us, and we mark them both as a new year. So anyway, Iyar is the second month, or the eighth month, however, however you're counting. It is the second month that uh, Israel was out of Egypt, and um, one of its uh, interpretations of the name Er, which is uh, spelled uh, Aleph Resh Resh Yud, is that it's Rashi Tevot, meaning an acronym for the words Ani Hashem Rof Echa, I am Hashem, your healer, which Hashem told Israel uh, soon after they crossed over the Reds, the Sea of Reeds. You can read that in the book of Exodus. I believe it's chapter 16. I'm not checking right now, but I believe it's chapter 16, if not the end of 15. I am Hashem, your healer. So uh, we learn from this that Er is a month of healing. And God willing, it will be a month of much healing. This year, we have much to be healed from. Um, er also... Uh, has the meaning of of brightness, light. And it's interesting because the original name of the month, which is mentioned in the Book of Kings, it's mentioned even in the context of the building of the first uh, Mikdash, the first holy temple, the f original name in Hebrew was Ziv, which also means brightness, uh, radiance, bright light. And... Um, it's understood to be referring to the fact that we're in springtime and uh, the days are bright, the sky is bright, the days are long and uh, trees are in, and, and, and flowers are in full bloom and it's a, a bright time of the year and of course it's also the time, um, it's post-Exodus now, but still uh, we're, we're still basking in the light of, of redemption, of freedom, of liberation. And just as a as a quick uh, uh, roundup or rundown or however you want to call it of important days in the month of Eir, I'm just happened to open a Wikipedia page uh, about Er, and let's see the uh, the uh, fourth of Er, which is actually this coming Motzei Shabbat, this coming Saturday evening is Yom HaZikaron, Israel Memorial Day, which is going to be, wow, a very, very extremely difficult day this year in Israel in light of recent events, as you all know. The following day, the 5th of Iyar, which begins us, which will begin Sunday evening immediately after Yom HaZikaron, is Yom HaAtzma'ut, Israel Independence Day, because that was the day that Israel in 19... Uh, 48 declared her independence 
And that's also going to be a difficult day, despite the fact that it's a celebratory day. It's a celebration, but uh, we have much to reflect upon this year. Moving right along, the 10th of ER happens to be Herzl Day, a day um, I don't think too many people have heard about it, but a day in order to honor Theodore Herzl, the, the father, as it were, of the modern Zionist movement, and really a prophet of the modern state of Israel, a very fascinating individual who really saw into the future. Um, and uh, the 14th of ER is Pesach Sheni, the second Passover, which we also read about in the book of Exodus. Um, actually, we don't. We read about it in the book of Numbers, that uh, those individuals who were impure, uh, with Tomei Meit, impurity, having come in contact with the with a dead corpse were not able to bring their Passover offering on the appointed day, the 14th of, of uh, Nisan. And so they were given special dispensation, is that the word? Um, to bring it the following month, on the 14th of Iyar. And again, that became the halacha, uh, one who could not bring it on the 14th of Nisan, either due to impurity or due to the fact that he was too distant from Jerusalem to arrive in Jerusalem in time. That doesn't go for those who didn't bother to make the effort. It goes for those who who were on the way and had reached a certain point but just couldn't make it uh, all the way to Jerusalem, uh, either because of the traffic along the route or perhaps in clement weather. They had a good excuse. They could bring it the following month. And of course, the uh, holiday of Pesach Sheni, which is a minor holiday today, we refer to it as that. It's just a day that that uh, we mark and commemorate. There's no real. Uh, some people will have matzah on that day just to commemorate the day, but uh, it's also uh, gained the name of as being the uh, the holiday of second chances because it was as we just described. There's a ch- second chance to to bring your offering for Passover and sort of embodies the concept of and the fact that life we have second chances and that Hashem grants us second chances and that uh, uh, we can always make up and do better and repair and um, of course it's all it's only a second chance if you had the intention uh, from the beginning uh, you know, we we can't get endless second chances if we're not really trying. But if we're trying, we certainly deserve and are granted a second chance. The 18th of ER is Lag Baomer, and uh, that is, uh, of course, the 33rd day, Lamed Gimel, being the uh, Hebrew letters that uh, are the equivalent of 33 Lag Baomer. 33 day of the counting of the Omer. It's the day of the the Ilui of uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the composer of the Zohar. Um, Ilui meaning a day of his death. It's a day that's celebrated. Uh, this year, the celebrations, uh, national celebrations, which usually take place on Har Maron, where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried. Uh, will not take place because of the security situation, but uh, it will be marked and celebrated locally, more modestly. Uh, and we'll, of course, be talking about that in the upcoming weeks. Uh, moving right along, we come to the 28th of ER, which is Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. That was the day that uh, that uh, Jerusalem was liberated, day that the Temple Mount was liberated, and. Uh, that's a day that we definitely celebrate each year. And then in this Wikipedia page, there are a number of other uh, dates uh, throughout our history, uh, deaths of this uh, sage or that sage, all different things. I'm not going to, I'm not certainly not going to go over this entire list. It's very long. Um, but the one other thing I do want to note is that, yes, the Six Day War began on the 26th of ER, meaning that it was the third day of the war, the 28th, that Jerusalem was liberated. And the 28th of ER also happens to be, no coincidence, at the death of Shmuel, Samuel the prophet. 
um, he died on the 28th and why say no coincidence it's because he was um, uh, very significant in really the the founding the promotion of, of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and of course it was he who uh, with King David uh, planned and discussed the building of the of the of the Mikdash of the first temple which of course David David was not did not merit to build but his son uh, Shlomo Solomon did merit to build and so Samuel is very much associated with Jerusalem so it's I say no coincidence it's very very sweet that uh, the day that we mark his passing is the day of the liberation of Jerusalem Yom Yerushalayim um, so there there you have it that's the month of ER so actually it's a very very busy month and of course all throughout the month of ER we are counting the Omer I neglected to say but uh, today is today is 14 days which are two weeks of the Omer and of course the Omer is the counting of the 49 days between Passover and Shavuot the seven weeks seven complete weeks and so we've completed two weeks and um, also I started to say all throughout the month of, of, of uh, ER we are counting the Omer so every day we have a special mitzvah special commandment that we can fulfill by counting the Omer um, other news Israel has entered in these past 24 hours has entered into Rafiach also known as Rafah the southernmost town city and stronghold of Hamas in the Gaza Strip something that Israel has been talking about doing for many a month something that I believe Israel should have done many months ago something that the Biden administration has been doing its best to prevent Israel to do which is the main reason why it hadn't been done many months ago again I know I've talked about this in the past but it seems like every week there's just more more new stories and more evidence being uncovered of the Biden administration's uh, basically attempts to to compel Israel not to win this war to allow Hamas to stay alive to allow Hamas if they stay alive to stay uh, in control of Gaza and to be remain a threat to Israel um, what is their reasoning I don't want to get um, too involved in that right now because I think we could spend uh, the next uh, five programs just talking about that but uh, and you could also uh, take the position that they don't really have a program or, or they have more than one program and there's many conflicting uh, directions that they're going in but they basically uh, uh, you know they'll support Israel in its defensive efforts but in an offensive effort they have basically said outright uh, we're not going to support you and there's all sorts of threats uh, implied threats and real threats and uh, all sorts of attempts to to uh, block Israel from from uh, proceeding and all sorts of underhanded things uh, going on. It's very unpleasant to see the United States government treating an ally in such a manner. And I know that there are many Americans who feel the same feel the same way. And I know that there are uh, many American politicians who are also speaking out against the way America is is treating Israel. You have to wonder who the Biden administration really wants to win, uh, and um, you know, uh, do they want Israel or do they want Hamas, which means Iran? And uh, it's uh, it's very sad, very very sad. It's very very sad, very frightening what's going on in the United States. And I, um, you know, I read the the news I read the polls and I want to believe that the polls are correct that the vast majority of the United States citizens are supportive of Israel and certainly are not supportive of Hamas and understand that Hamas is a terrorist organization that has committed uh, mass murder committed uh, uh, genocide really has committed uh, mass rape and brutality and and torture etc etc um, and that the 
despicable actions and behavior that's happening on, on uh, universities in the United States and in cities in the United States is only represents, a God, God willing, only represents a very, very small minority of the Americans. And we also, it's becoming more and more clear, uh, as I should say, our suspicions have been uh, have been verified that uh, much of this is agitation from the outside. Much of the agitation and participa participation certainly are not college students, and many of them are not even legal uh, citizens in the United States. And um, uh, many of them have been organizing and preparing for this for months and months and months ahead of October 7th. So uh, they've been waiting for the opportunity, or maybe they knew what was going to happen. Um, and we're preparing for that, and also who's behind it in terms of the funding is coming out. And um, I'm hearing now that many of the organizations that are funding uh, these uh you know, encampments and, and takeovers of public buildings, et cetera, et cetera, are uh, the same people who are funding the the uh, Biden candidacy. So it's pretty despicable. It's pretty discouraging. It's pretty disgusting. It's vile. And um, I really hope and pray that... Uh, that uh, the good, decent people in the United States, the good, God-fearing people in the United States, the good people who who want what's best for all, will rise up and uh, show yourselves and make yourselves uh, felt and heard in what's happening in the United States. Um, speaking of which, God-fearing people and people who only want good for other people, let's talk about Parashat Kedoshim, which is this coming Shabbat's parasha. It begins in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 1, concludes chapter 20, verse 27. It's a relatively short parasha, short read. And the word Kedoshim means holy, it's plural. Kadosh is the singular, and it is the overriding theme of this parsha. And we're going to uh, read the first few verses in Hebrew, then in English, and then we're going to discuss what's, what does it mean to be kadosh, what does it mean to be holy, certainly as the Torah understands it. So here we are, chapter 19, verse 1, book of Leviticus, Vayedeber Hashem el Moshe lemor. Daber el kol adat bnei Yisrael v'amamata alehem kadoshim to you ki kadosh ani Hashem eloichem ish imo va'aviv tirau v'et shabtotai tishmoru ani Hashem eloichem al tifnu el ha'elidim v'elohei masecha lo ta'asu lachem ani Hashem eloichem v'chi tizbachu zevach shlamim la'Hashem l'rutzonchem tizbachu. Tisbachuhu Biom Zivachem Yahil Umimhorat Vanota Ad Yomashlishi Baish Isaref Vim He Ahol Yahil Bayomashlishi Pigulhu Lo Yiratse Uklav Avono Yisa Et Kodeshadun Ashem Hilel Venihrata Hanefeshahi Meamea. Okay, we'll stop right there. And now in English, Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the entire assembly of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for holy am I, Hashem, your God. Every man, your mother and father, shall you revere, and my, and my Sabbath shall you observe. I am Hashem, your God. Do not turn to the idols and molten gods, shall you not make for yourselves. I am Hashem, your God. When you slaughter a feast, a feast, peace offering to Hashem. You shall slaughter it to find favor for yourselves. On the day of your slaughter shall it be eaten, and on the next day, and what is, whatever remains until the third day shall be burned in fire. But if it shall be eaten on the third day, it is rejected, it shall not be accepted. Eat, each of those who eat of it will bear his iniquity, for what is sacred to Hashem has been desecrated, and that soul will be cut off from his people. 
Okay, I'm going to read another verse now in English. When you reap your harvest of your land, you shall not complete your reaping to the corner of your field, and the gleanings of your harvest shall you shall not take. You shall not pick the undeveloped twigs of your vineyard, and the fall fruit, and the fallen fruit of your vineyard you shall not gather. For the poor and the, and the proselyte shall you leave them. I am Hashem your God. Okay, it goes on and on. There's a lot of, of sort of one line uh, mitzvot coming up. That's all potpourri as it were, but the th there's a constant theme running through all of these different mitzvot, and that is I'm Hashem your God and you should be holy. And what's that all about? And of course the most famous of all of the commandments um, in Parshat Kedoshim is of course uh, chap uh verse 18 um, and I'm just going to read it first in Hebrew and then in English Lotikom velotitor et bene amecha v'ahavta l'reacha komocha ani Hashem and that in English is um you shall not take revenge, and you shall not bear a grudge against the members of your people. Of your people, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Hashem, and of course, the second half of that verse is the most famous half. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Hashem. Va'ahavta l'reacha kamocha ani Hashem. Um. So, what's what's this idea that uh, why we keep why is God, why does the Torah keep reminding us that God is Hashem? Why is His name being uh, in, injected into each of these different commandments? And, and what is the idea of us being holy? Now, this goes back really to to uh, Mahmad Har Sinai, to the Sinai experience, when before the receiving of the Torah, Hashem says, you will be a nation of... Uh, uh, you shall be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests of Kohanim, right? You shall be a holy nation. What does that mean? Let's talk about that a bit. So, the actual literal meaning of kadosh, holy, in Hebrew is is separate from. Um, so, what do we mean by that? And you know, some people say, oh, you know, so. So Israel is uh, Am Kadosh, they're separate. Oh, they're separate. They're, you know, they're better. They think they're better. That they won't mix. Um, they think they're different. Uh, well, we do think we're different. We don't think we're better, but we think we're expected to be the best we can be. That is our covenant. That's our commitment uh, with Hashem and with ourselves. But... Uh, I would uh, hope and pray that every um, every every group that sees itself as a people or as as a community um, uh, sees what's unique in its own uh, community in its own nation and pledges and strives to be the best they can be. And I think that every nation, every people, every community should have that which they think is unique to themselves. Um, you know, we're all created in the image of God, which means we're all unique, because God is one. So there's not a plur there's not a plurality of images of Hashem. We each reflect a different aspect, perhaps, of our understanding of Hashem, of our realization of Hashem. But but that we're unique, and peoples are unique. And they should be able to express their uniqueness without feeling that uh, there there's anything wrong with that, or that by being unique you're somehow disparaging other people. Every nation, every person should feel the uniqueness that God has blessed them with, and and work with it and develop it. And that should be, I would think, your life's project to discover your uniqueness, discover what your purpose is, and to strive your very best to to uh, realize and fulfill it but Kadoshim also as I started to say we get our our Kadosh God is God is Kadosh God is 
everywhere but distinct, but separate. God is here but not here. God is here but we can't touch, we can't feel, we can't see God. God is the epitome, as it were, of Kadosh. And so when God implores, basically commands us to be Kadoshim, He's saying, He's saying, be like me. Be holy, for I'm your God, I'm holy, right? That's exactly what we read at the very first verse. If a verse say to the children of Israel, you shall be holy, for I, Hashem, your God, am holy. Well, how much can we be like Hashem? That seems like a very tall order. But to, to have that holiness that Hashem has, the answer is to allow Hashem to exist within us, allow Hashem's presence to flourish within us, because that's the holiness. We are vessels where, you know, to to be able to contain Hashem's holiness, and each one of us is a unique vessel. And so, the shape or the the type uh, or the expression of Hashem's holiness will be unique in each one of us, but we must understand and respect that each one of us is, does contain Hashem's holiness, and each one of us is a, an expression of Hashem's holiness, and each one of us must strive to be the, the finest expression of Hashem's holiness that we can be. Not everyone does, and that's very problematic, but that is sort of the key behind all all life really, but certainly behind uh, the commandments as they're being presented here in, in Parshat Kedoshim. Um, and again, the, the most famous uh, commandment and the one that really embodies this the most is you shall love your, your fellow or your neighbor, depending on how you want to translate, as yourself, I am Hashem. So, you know, people say, well, a couple questions. How can you command to be, how can you be commanded to love? And what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? What does it mean to love yourself? I am Hashem. So, look, actually, the answer to all those questions is in those last three words, I am Hashem, or in Hebrew, uh, the two words, Ani Hashem. Um, I am what you share. I am what you have in common. So you can love yourself because because you embody an aspect of, of me, Hashem. You embody an aspect of my holiness. And that is something that you should love because it's unique to you. It's precious to you. It's only you. It's a gift that God gave to you for your lifetime and it's unique. It wasn't given to anyone before, and it won't be given to anyone again. It's an absolute unique expression of Hashem that is yours to, to cherish. It's yours to express. It's yours to develop. It's yours to share. And the person standing opposite you also has a unique, within him, a unique expression, a unique aspect, a, a unique reflection of Hashem's holiness. And that's what you have in common, even though you each have a ex different expression of Hashem's holiness. It's His holiness, it's Hashem's presence that you share. That's what you, that's what allows us to, to love one another. Um, and that really is the big secret here. And when you look at it that way, you really get a different perspective on all these different commandments and, and why we have commandments. They're all, every commandment is a way that we can express our connection to Hashem and our connection to one another. And of course, you know, some of these commands, some of that we've even read about so far, when you reap the harvest of your land, we're, you know, we're leaving the corner of the land, some of the harvest, we're not gathering so that the the destitute, the poor people, the the widows, the orphans, the uh, strangers in the land can can all come and 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 
be able to gather from it and have sub- sustenance for themselves. That is an act of, of goodness that we're commanded to do. What a what a wonderful commandment that you know commanded to do something that's going to not only help and enhance the lives of others, but it also enhance your own life because it's giving you that ability to connect. And that really is what makes us complete people. Uh, you know, God said it's not good for man to be a- alone, so he created woman. The idea wasn't simply that we would all find our our completion, our perfection, as it were, uh, by finding our our, our partner for life. Uh, but also all of us, we all need to connect. Man needs to be a social animal in order to, in order to fulfill himself and in order to be become a society or a civilization that can that can be its best and when those things break down and uh, people feel isolation and people aren't reaching out to one another and people are uh, turning off from one another or rejecting one another that's when uh, civilization that's when society begins to break down and I feel and I fear that that is much of what's happening in the world today at least the Western world that there is a turning away from one another that we've been taught you know the Western world has been taught that you know there is no God there is no Hashem there is no nothing binding us all together there is no inspiration that holds us together there's just science and science is facts science is 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 material and science is amoral there's no good or bad in science it just is and so you know the world which has been for you know uh, well over a hundred years a few hundred years is certainly in the past hundred years an accelerated uh, dependence and um, obsession with science you know follow the science um, we follow the science and the science yes it can give us facts and it can solve lots of problems but it doesn't give us direction it doesn't give us moral direction it doesn't give us uh, the ability to see and distinguish between right and wrong and that's a problem because when people are brought up and raised in such an environment um, they are raised without and if they're raised uh, without uh, a traditional uh, religious upbringing or background uh, then they're raised in in an environment that doesn't teach them either that how to distinguish between right and wrong between good and evil or that there even is such a thing right you see that so much uh, of of the twisting of, of of values today and the twisting of you know what's good is bad what's bad is good um you know all of a sudden terror is good and decency is bad all of a sudden the united states is the enemy for so many uh well educated college students but what are they well educated in they're well educated in a system that teaches them technology teaches them science but fails to teach them uh, how to live their lives properly fails to teach them how to determine what's right and what's not right what's good and what's evil Parshat Kedoshim is all about bringing holiness, Hashem's presence into our lives and, and understanding that that's what bonds us together, that's what brings us together. I gotta go. Thanks for being with me. Temple Talk.